you, Adia, for that warm and kind introduction. I want to take the mic off the mic stand and uh, make a confession to you. I'm not a drinker, so I just had me a glass of hard cider, and I'm actually feeling a little drunk. My wife laughs at me all the time that it's taken me all these years to start drinking and I can get drunk from one glass of hard apple cider. So I'm gonna try to get through this lecture, or this talk. How are you guys doing? Good evening. Uh, I'm glad you guys invited me. I am most honored to be talking to you guys about education and race and how they connect. I actually have a slide I wanna start with. It's called The Metaphor of Life and Death in the Classroom. And I really want us to sort of think about this in medical terms. So if the relationship between healthcare provider and the patient is sacrosanct, it's about life and death. It's what that doctor or that nurse does to uh, save the patient who may be on uh, his or her way to the hospital, may be on a gurney, may be in the hospital already. Uh, I think that we don't have a problem with that hospital or with that healthcare provider pulling up pulling out all the, all, the, all the stops, all the procedures, all of the, the knowledge that that person may have to save that patient, right? To save that person. And we understand that. We're okay with that. In many ways, we believe that that's the correct thing to do. But if the relationship between teacher and student is about life and death, the question becomes, what does that look like? And what does that mean for a teacher? What does it mean for a student? What does that mean for a school district? What does that mean for a state that is responsible for that teacher? Let's think about that because I don't think that we believe that unless the student happens to be, happens to be white and middle class and privileged in a certain way. We will not stand for white kids of privilege and wealth to be miseducated, to be uneducated, to be undereducated, and certainly not to fail out of the system. We would consider that a life and death situation. But for some reason when we come, when it comes to students of color, we don't take the same measures. We do not respond similarly and I want to talk about why that may be the case. So, meet Devin. Devin is an African-American male. He's 15 years old. He's in the 10th grade. Uh, he is a student at Minneapolis Public School. This is actually not his real name. They told me I could not use, of course, the, you guys know that you can't use uh, sensitive data like that. Uh, he is a, Spain, he's a special education student. He has a GPA of 1.7. Sporadic attendance in some classes, disengaged in others, uninspired by the school environment, on the road to failing 10th grade, will potentially drop out. I wanna ask you the question, is this a case of life and death? Yes. Absolutely. But why is it that we don't treat it as such? Is it because he's an urban student? Is it because he's African American? Is it because he is male, he's a black male? And is it something that we understand as foregone? Is it a foregone conclusion for us to accept that African-American men and African-American students don't finish high school? And I think that the answer to that question, I heard one resounding yes to that, right? So the question becomes, what's the diagnosis? What's the remedy for Devin? Parker Palmer says the way we di diagnose our students' condition will determine the kind of remedy we offer as teachers. And I want to add to that by saying the kind of remedy we offer students will reflect what teachers have in their toolkits. So what does this mean, the way we diagnose our students' condition will determine the kind of remedy we offer as teachers? If we have no solution to Devon, in the Devons, not only of Minneapolis public schools, but across the country. If we have no way of understanding 
why Devin may be in that situation. If we write Devin off, if we accept that Devin will be part of the school to prison pipeline, then we have failed Devin over and over again. We have not allowed ourselves to understand Devin's situation and the community in which he comes from as a life and death situation. So I want us to think about the ways in which we can actually begin to change our behavior and to change our thinking when it comes to these kinds of students. The kind of remedy we offer students will reflect what's in the teachers, what teachers have in their toolkits. I talk about this all the time. We always look at Devin from a deficit model. It's what Devin is bringing to the classroom. Devin may be coming from a poor community. His family may be poor. He may be missing one parent or two parents. His parents may, not, may be absent. His parents may be strung out on drugs. His parents may be in jail. He may be free, he may be free and reduced. He may be hungry coming to school. So we start with that as a framework for understanding why Devin is not learning. Devin is coming to school with deficits. But I like to focus the attention on what deficits may be in the teacher's, as I call it, toolbox. Devin still needs to be taught. Devin still is deserving of an education. The question is, what kind of education will Devin receive? And I think the most important relationship in the system is between the student and the teacher. I know it's a heavy burden for teachers to carry, to try to teach students like Devin. But I think that it's what's lacking in our toolbox that will not allow us to connect with students like Devin. So what do I mean by toolbox? What's in it? You guys know what's in the toolbox. Name some tools that's in the toolbox that we can use. Relationships, give me another one. Suspensions, I like that, because that is in the toolbox. Give, patience, absolutely, patience is another one. Say it again. Expectations, having clear and high expectations for Devin. Respect is another one. Time, I like that one. Ooh, who said that? culturally relevant pedagogy. So the content has to, be, has to be great. Give me one more. Say it again. Stereotypes. Oftentimes, we could talk about the license that we have, where we went to school to get the degree, the credential, the mere fact that we've been teaching uh, for 20, 25, 30, 40 years. That's what's in my toolbox. If that's what's in your toolbox, then you should be able to connect and teach the Devons of the world. But too often I see the saw of indifference, the wrench of low expectations, the clamp of mediocrity, the nail of white racism, the hammer of oppression, the tape measure of failure. The reason why I'm using these as metaphors to describe what goes on in the classroom because that's exactly what I see from, to, from student to teacher or from teacher to student, right? Too often, the Devons are written off. And not only are the Devons written off, there are some insidious things that go on in classrooms between teachers and students, right? And one of the things that is problematic to me, and it's not necessary, it's not only white teachers to students of color, a lot of African-American teachers, the few that we have in the system, uh, teachers of color exhibit some of this behavior, is that there is not a preoccupation to connect with these students in urban environments, right? So we talk about the achievement gap. We know that, I just told you that Devin had a GPA that's what? 1.7. That Devin more than likely will not graduate from high school. We know about the gaps, the achievement gap numbers. We love to focus on the numerics. But there are other gaps that we don't pay attention to. 
There are inspiration gaps, motivation gaps, engagement gaps, relationship gaps. These are gaps that are at the beginning of the learning process. That if we can close some of these gaps, we will close the numerical gaps that we are so fixated on, right? We love the fact that we can say it, and I, I was just at an um, achievement gap conversation with Tom Weber, and he had uh, Commissioner Casilius uh, on, and she was on campus with a colleague of, my, of mine, Catherine Squires, and they talked about uh, that the graduation rate for, I think it's for the state, is up around 82%, 82, 84%. And that, the, but the graduation rate for uh, students of color much less. So in the, in the 60s for African, I think it's 60% for African American students. When you disaggregate that and look at the graduation rate for black males, it's like 39, 40%. At least for uh, in Minneapolis public schools, it may be statewide as well. So the question is, is that we have these gaps that we love to focus on, but no one wants to peel back the layers and understand exactly what is going on with these gaps. And of course, Gloria Lance and Billings and other scholars have renamed this as an opportunity gap because there are many ways in which uh, students of color do not receive, receive the same resources that will lead to some of the same opportunities to increase graduation rates, increase GPAs, but these are the gaps that we need to focus on. And these gaps lie in the toolbox that I mentioned. The question is, how do we redirect our resources when it comes to teacher training, when it comes to professional development, to understand that teachers need to understand what really lies at the heart of student failure? So here's Devin again. Devin came to the Office of Black Male Student Achievement which is a new initiative started in Minneapolis Public Schools to focus specifically on black male students. He came to what is called the black class by way of teacher referral. Let me ask you this, if there is an office of black male student achievement and there is something called a black class and he was referred to the class by a white teacher, tell me what's going on with Devin. He was labeled profile after he languished in the classrooms of others. And when the black class came along, the teacher said, you know what, Devin? Why don't you actually go into that class? Now, the Office of Black Male Student Achievement was set up for that reason. Many of the students come into the class by teacher referral. But when he came in, he told the teacher, who's an African-American teacher, that he would not participate. He did not want to share his story because the class is designed to set up to immediately give these students voice, to give these students space to understand not only who they are, they are, but it also gives them space to articulate a vision for themselves. The class is different because it allows these students to be subjects in their education, not objects, right? So he said, I won't participate. I don't want to be bothered. I want to sit in the back of the class. They said, no, 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 you can't do that. You got to sit in the front and you got to tell your story. Well, after telling his story and he listened to the narrative journeys of other black males in the class, he began to change how he felt about speaking and providing perspective and giving voice in the educational process, right? He thought that it was liberating to have others hear his story. So he said, well, I'll tell my story if others are telling it, but actually, I really love the fact that I heard his story. His story mirrored mine. And not only did I find common ground with another student in class, now I understand that we are similarly situated as young black men. He found his voice, which allowed him to think about what it means to be a student in school. So I just want to briefly turn to what I'm calling a critical theory of blackness, which is built on critical race theory. 
that Dr. Brooks talked about. Critical race theory has been around for a while. For a while, it essentially highlights all of the problematic racial impediments that are in the way of learning. Not only in a classroom, not only within a school or a school district or a state, but in society as well. It is a theory that allows race to be deconstructed at all levels. And everywhere you may find race rearing its ugly head. It's a theory of teaching and learning when we talk about it in the classroom. It's about connecting teacher with new content with the student. It's about the self and the student. Now think about this, the self as a source of knowledge to begin to think about who you are in the world. So the black class starts with the black student. So the student walks in. I love it when teachers say, I don't see race. I don't see the race of the kids in the class. Because when they walk their black selves in the room, how the heck you don't see me? But I'm stepping in there with all this blackness. And what am I walking in there with? I'm walking in there with not only a black body that's a source of knowledge, but I'm walking in there with my own experience. I have a neighborhood experience. I have a community experience. I have a, a family experience. I may have ex an experience. I just told you about Devin and all the things that we say is so-called wrong with him. All of those are materials to be used in the classroom to begin uh, to spark learning. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about sparking learning, serving, using the source of the self as inspiration to create critical learners and critical things. We talk about critical thinkers all the time, but we have to think about this as critical learning. Sometimes I use my own autobiography or my biography about who I am. Here I was as a New York City a high school kid, went through the whole system, elementary, middle, and high school, and wasn't a great student. I graduated high school with a D average. I only graduated because I had a, enough shame in me to not want to go home telling my mother that I didn't graduate. So I just languished in the system and, and got the diploma. But here's the thing. I, and I tell my wife this all the time, that, and she knows this, and she teases me. She says, you love me, I know you love me, but you love somebody more, and that will never change. She said, you love your books more. And she's right. I fell, <laughs> no, she's right. I fell in love with reading at 18 years of age. Here was a kid that hated reading for 18 years of my life. I don't know what it was. I ran into two books, Chancellor Williams, The Destruction of Black Civilization and The Autobiography of Malcolm X. And those two books explain everything about the Harlem community. So when I traversed the streets of my neighborhood and I saw burned out tenements and drug dealing, the books explain why that was the case. That's all I needed, right? So the spark to learn when it comes to black and brown students is in them already. It's in the environment. It's in the books that we, we covered as professors of African American studies because we believe that the texts that we teach from and we use are truly indeed transformational, right? So now here's the thing about um, where is Devin going? So Devin now is an engaged learner. He has increased his presence in all of his classes. He asks questions about the content. He's completing assignments, staying in the system, planning his future. I was talking to Grayson at the table before Keith Brooks went on, and he says that, you know, when, when we talk about the achievement gap, tell me what we should be measuring. I said, if we're looking at students who are completely disengaged, then all we have to look at is, are they now engaged? Are they reading? Do they have an interest in understanding what's going on in the classroom? And that's what you see in the black classes. So we, we have seen that the GPAs have increased, but the first thing we saw was that the students did what? They came to that class every 
day. They didn't miss a class because they felt that not only was the class nourishing for them, but that they felt the transformational process take place, right? So why is it that we reject sources of knowledge that come from people of color? That's the question. And why is it that we don't actually think about in teacher training to use those sources of knowledge from people of color to begin the process of creating better in-service teachers as well as pre-service teachers? Because there's something about the way we understand black and brown bodies. They are not worth what? Go back to the first slide. They must not be worth what? Saving. It must be a life or death situation, whereas we are willing to allow them to do what? Die. We prefer that they died and disappear because their lives are not worthy enough. And this has everything to do with how we understand people, people who are racially marked, people who are different from us, us against them. So the question becomes, if we really want to solve this problem of the achievement gap, we've got to recognize that there are other sources of knowledge, and those sources of knowledge come from the people in the classrooms who are black and brown and who we understand as failing. And we, un and we in many ways have written off um, and, and believe that there is no hope for them. This is a student problem. I'm going to tell you, and I agree. There is, if this was a room, I always tell people, if this was a room full of African Americans, particularly African American students, would I be standing up here telling them this? What sense would, I, would, would it make for me to tell them and give them this talk about what's not in the teacher's toolkit? What would I tell a room full of black students? What's not in whose toolkit? In theirs. I'm talking to a room predominantly of white people who many may be educators and concerned citizens. And I'm saying that it's a two-way process. We got to bring the teaching and the student in alignment, close the gap by understanding that there are different forms of content knowledge and different pedagogy, pedagogies that we need to use in the classroom. I will stop right there because Adia just stood up, which is my cue to, to wrap it up. Thank you very much.